Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Quantum Medical and, and Julian for offering me to be here tonight. Uh, after Victor's great intro introduction about the bases and the different kinds of laser they are, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the practical manage of the day-to-day -day basis for central serous and diabetic macular edema patients, which are the two main indications nowadays for subthreshold or subliminal laser. I'm going to use these two terms, subthreshold, subliminal, indistinctly along the talk. Well, first of all, just two words about how do we do it, right? Uh, for anyone just a little bit used to perform conventional macular laser, the learning curve is relatively flat. But there is this particular considerations which make all the sense taking into account what Victor told us earlier. First of all, we have to treat a large area. We are not burning a microaneurysm. We are not shooting that leaking point. We are stimulating uh, a bunch of RP and indirectly Müller cells to produce a therapeutically interesting response. Since the potential of a single cell is very little, we need a lot of them to work for us. So we need a large area. And for this very same reason, we have to treat these areas densely. Densely means do not leave any blank spots. So every cell which you encompass in your treatment gets recruited. Let's call it this way. And of course, also also secondary is the appropriate power. Avoid using too much power, otherwise you will be perform performing a super threshold treatment that will result in cell changes, scarring, and all the changes visible on fundoscopy, OCT, and autofluorescence. The, a laser burn has no intrinsic therapeutic value when treating macular disease, so it should be avoided. And that's what subthreshold does. It removes all the scar, all the, all the negative parts from conventional laser. It's kind of a purified laser. I'll talk, I'll talk more later about titration. I remember that insufficient spots has been identified as number one cause for treatment failure, right? At 160 spots, which is the, the use, the, the, the diameter we are using with subliminal, you need 100 of them just to fill one, one optic nerve space. So you need a lot of them to cover larger areas. The subliminal device comes equipped with a couple of features that will help you attain your, the, 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 these two targets. First of all is the pattern. It, it, whether it's the square or the macular grid, it envelops with the laser the area you, you, pre, you pretend to treat to make sure you envelop an area high enough, um, large enough. And then there's the resume function. If you have to stop the treatment for whatever the reason the patient moves or whatever, you just put back in place the pattern and the treatment will restart right where you left it, just making sure you do not leave any blank space that you are using all the cell potential you have at your disposal. And let's talk about applications. Why should we be treating central serous? Why should we consider subliminal so threshold for central serous instead of PDT, the standard treatment? Well, first of all, with central serous, we do not need intravenous, uh, intravenous sorry, pertoporphine, advisodin, which is not cheap. It's becoming increasingly difficult to obtain, and it's of course, of course, less patient friendly. I mean, with some threshold, the patient can resume his life immediately. He doesn't, he doesn't need to go home and hide from sunlight for a couple of days. You can retreat as many times as you require with sub threshold, and there are no registered side effects of properly performed sub threshold treatment. Instead, with, with PT, we know that we will be facing a certain, a certain percentage of choroidal neovascular extension, macular atrophy, uh, macular hypofunction, and so on. Most, or except for one study, study the available literature will, that you can find will agree that a sub subthreshold is a feasible alternative to PDT for treating chronic central serous. There is one remarkable exception, the place study, I'll get back to it later if I got the time or, or perhaps, perhaps, and perhaps during the questions. Let me show you a few examples. Here we have a, a patient with this fluctuating, fluctuating temporal escotoma, about six months evolution, never really enveloping the fovea, but this, this, the relative escotoma was disturbing, so we treated right here over the uh, my, 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 <coughs> uh, papillary bundle. 
12 weeks later, we have a complete resolution, which remains after one year. I, to evaluate the subthreshold treatment, I like to use the thickness maps even more than the slides. The slides can be tricky, depending on in, in which one you choose. The thickness maps are show, give you a much more diffuse information of the thickness, which is what you are after when evaluating subthreshold. As you cannot see, the treatment is not visible. There's about 400 spots here, not visible on the fundus, and very important, not visible on the autofluorescence. I like very much to use autofluorescence to audit myself to make sure that I remain subthreshold, so the power I'm using is correct. You can see just a little bit of the titration here. This patient, after two failed PDT, we treated him with, with sub, subliminal, sorry again, with subliminal, oh, come on. Six weeks later, the subretinal fluid doesn't seem to have improved that much, but the interretinal fluid has, and there is a diffuse thinning. So we just wait six more weeks to complete resolution, stable after one year. More chronic cases will take longer to respond, but as long as you can see a trend of improvement, you can just wait, and it will generally keep improving. Another chronic case, in, in really chronic case like, the, like this one, like more than one year evolution, the state of the photoreceptor will determine the visual outcome. But of, and, and you will need to treat it an even larger area to recruit this more peripheral RPE that, that is still healthy and can cooperate into the disease resolution or disease control, let's just say. Cases with more fluid, it was a uh, five months evolution case, would take longer to respond, but as I said, as long as you observe improvement, you can just keep observing. If the, if the improvement stops, it slows down or even starts to recede, you can retreat. Uh, our results are pretty good. In fact, our numbers are, are a little, sorry, our numbers are a little bit la larger than this already. We have a high percentage of responders, most of them with showing total recovery after one session. From the remaining, most recovered with two sessions, and we have 14% with partial recovery after one or more session, and a couple of non-responders. Of course, nothing is perfect. And no side effect noted. Treatment guidelines, parameters. We, for the moment, are treating cr chronic CSE, four months at least. I use mostly the right autofluorescence. Since you do not need to, to find the leaking point exactly to shoot it with a subsequent PDT, you only need the, a general idea of where it is. Autofluorescence generally will be good enough to show you, and you can treat all that whole area, making sure you envelop, envelop encompass that leaking point and, and surroundings. With 5% duty cycle, spots on 160 microns, and I use a one-third power titration. I started, I started using one-half, it turned out to be too much for me. In my case, 15, 20% of the patients showed some spots, so I lowered it even a little bit more. The, I believe power titration level is something very personal because barely visible burn is a very subjective term because and which magnification, uh, which illumination, how peripheral, because the more peripheral you go, the more energy you need to obtain a visible burn because there is less concentration of RPE. So you should begin with conservative parameters and then go up to find what's more optimal for you. I also like to avoid the fovel treatment. Although the transfovel treatment has been declared safe for the available literature, and I believe it is, the available literature is produced by experts who know very well what they are doing. And when you're be beginning, and some extra steps of safety are always desir desirable. As I told you, uh, standard treatment implies hundreds of spots, two, three, seven hundred spots. So if instead of 500, you avoid the fog and surrounding and deliver 495, that will not affect your outcome. You treat a neighbor, even, although, even if the fog is affected by the edema or whatever, if you treat a neighboring area, uh, large enough and good enough, the, the positive effect will extend to the fovea. Usually at six weeks, you will start seeing something. So regarding CSC, subliminal has been safe and highly effective in our case. It's cost effective and repeatable compared to PDT. And of course, as any surgical procedure is operator dependent. It requires a certain amount of experience before you reach your best results. Now, let's move to DME. 
why should we consider subliminal for DME nowadays? To illustrate my point of on why some patients might benefit from it, I have made up this graphic, it's totally made up, for, made up by me, I mean, do not, do not look for proportions or, or any mathematics here. But I try to relate the anti edema power of the, of the option we, we, we are dealing with and its portfolio of secondary effects and cost. As the most powerful, I will put the steroids, intravitreal steroids, Suppose most of you will agree with me, are probably the most powerful tool we have for macular edema, for its local treatment at least. <coughs> they also come with their own unique portfolio of secondary effects, of course, cataract, glaucoma, and intra intravitreal implants such as Osurdex or Illuvian are anything but cheap. Next, I will put anti-VGF, maybe less powerful than steroids, but no glaucoma, no cataract. Of course, there is a small risk of, endo of endophthalmitis, which which, which, which would con count more as an undesirable effect than secondary effect. And here is where I've put subthreshold laser or subliminal laser at the lowest power, but also at the lowest level of cost as secondary effects, with the exception of the conventional ETDRS laser. Less efficient, less effective, more hazardous than subthreshold laser. After all, subthreshold is just ETDRS refined, so it makes sense. So why? We, why would we choose this weak option when you have those? Well, because the phenotype of diabetes is huge. I mean, there is a lot of variability between patients. We have infinite scenarios, almost each one, one for, for patients. So there are certain clinical scenarios, not a few, when a weak laser treatment is all you need. All you need, you will need to resort to more dangerous, to more expensive, uh, alternatives when you can do it uh, cost, co cost effectively and efficiently and safely. Of course, uh, subthreshold is not for every case, but it's for quite a lot of them. In which cases? It's got to be, in my experience, an inflammatory or exudative edema. The predominantly ischemic edema will not respond that well, probably because the ischemic RP is in no condition to, to respond to your laser stimulation. That still leaves us three scenarios. Let me show you some examples. The extrophobia, clinical significant macular edema. Still, most people nowadays would treat this with laser. It's, it's safely far from the phobia, so you can laser this, lower down the thickness, and keep this phobia and the vision safe. Subthreshold allows you to treat it. You know. In the case of diabetes, lights are separated 12 weeks, and let us say otherwise. Will give you a slow but durable treatment and very important, repeatable. No changes visible in RP. You can repeat it, and the patient will stay diabetic, so it will pro probably recur at one moment or another. One more case is only wind thickness maps. We treat this area, spe very specifically this area, and three months, three months later, thickness result, but we had thickening of another neighboring area. As I said, the patient, the eye, remains diabetic. Autofluorescence, spots are invisible. We can, we, I do not, I do not do <coughs> trans, transphobia, by, by a, but I get very close to the phobia until here, until 100 microns, no problem. Treat all this area, that makes for about 500 spots. So you can see there is this very nice thinning that six months later, later star, starts to recur. And as you can see, we have at the beginning these vascular malformations, these exudates that fade pleasantly to the side. Combination therapy, another thing very interesting. When the phobia is deeply involved and the vision is damaged, you don't want to lose time. We know the prognosis of survival for the photoreceptor depend between other factors among how much time is it bathed in the inflammatory soup. So you've got this, you want to dry this phobia, this macular center as soon as you can. So I inject first in these cases until I rescue the phobia, and then you can use a consolidation laser treatment Will, will give you a nice durable res response provided you've provided the previous enough intravitreal treatment. It's very difficult to know if one patient would need one, two, or more injections before we respond to laser. It, it's related, in my experience, to the inflammatory background. The longer that, that edema has existed, the more injections you need before the edema is fresh enough to respond to laser. 
My preferred patients are those because they are kind of orphan of uh, proper treatment. When the phobia is already involved, the division is still great, 0 0.8 or more. Here, observation has a certain risk of worsening. Intravitreal therapy is costly, um, and endophthalmitis in a 2020 eye is rather a disaster. The conventional lasers so close to the phobia, no very good idea. But subthreshold laser can get very close or even over the phobia. And, and you can control these small edemas, preventing them to progress to something bigger, something larger, that damage more the vision. So it was a, a high hazard for vision. One more case is one as a small neurosensory detachment, which, which we aborted. Larger one also involve, involving a bit of the peripheral macula, no problem, we treat the whole area. All these patients are 0 0.8 or more. Phobia enveloped 360, very small cysts, so we can control them, we can see the diffuse thinning, although some thickening remains. This is the case I just showed you. So you can see spots invisible, 300 around and 60 around phobia. This is a bit of a limit case, quite a thick edema, but the patient was still seeing well, so I gave laser a try, and it worked pretty well. Maybe not the best case for a beginner, but still very good response. We conducted a small study, sky series, 23 eyes, I think. In, in this specific kind of patients, vision 0.8 and the phobia involved by the edema nocity. We obtain significant decrease of, of central retinal thickness. Those are not large numbers, but of course, we're talking about retinas that are not too large to, to thicken to begin with. And most of patients showed improvement or even complete resolution at first and final visit. And visual re region remained stable. All this, those, some cases I already showed you. Literature in these cases tends to contemplate just two things, observation versus intravitreal treatment, especially the protocol V. As you know, protocol V had three arms, observation, intravitreal treatment, or conventional laser for this kind of patients. And it concluded that after two years, there were, uh, observation was a reasonable alternative because there were no significant vision difference. But of course, this is under two conditions. First, you have to watch over the patients in a trial degree level of frequency. Every three months, vision, OCT, and look at them very carefully. And as soon as they lose vision, treat them. How many patients of the observation group required intravitreal treatment? 34%, one out of three. How much treatment? Seven injections median along two years. So observation is a good alternative if you have, you have needle re real ready. Well, there is nothing I haven't told you yet, I believe here. Simply sparing the phobia doesn't seem to worse our results. And remember the buts we have to say about the literature. And of course, no one has already made a study using an arm with subthreshold laser. Treatment guidelines are pretty much the same as with, as with central serous, no much difference. Just takes a little bit more of patience to see results and it's quite, uh, quite a little bit of a more patient-tailored case, uh, patient-tailored treatment. The DME is, is way more complex disease than CSC. There's more, more, way more variety. Conclusions to, for the day-to-day -day use of subliminals of threshold for CSC and DME. Patient selection is, is key. Remember, surface area and density are the cornerstone of successful treatment. Have a little bit of patience at least more than the one we are used to with intravitreal treatments. And very important, as with any surgical procedure, because after all, laser and, and subliminal laser is control damage, and that's the, the shortest definition of surgery, control damage. How did your results and yourself, so you, you stay safe and you get better day by day. And I think with this, you should be perfectly safe and getting good results in no time. Thank you.